Thanks for watching this session of the 2024 Housing Oregon Conference. We're a growing organization of over 120 members working to strengthen affordable housing in Oregon. If you found this helpful, smash that like button and hit subscribe for more updates. Slide decks and handouts are linked below. Together, we amplify the voices of developers, owners, and renters across the state. Visit housingoregon.org to learn more or to support our mission. Um, but uh, good afternoon. My name is Sarah Radcliffe. I work with Habitat for Humanity Portland Region, um, and I'm very excited to introduce and moderate our panel today. Um, and I'll just start off with a couple of words just to kind of set context. Um, I don't know about you all, but when I started working in housing, which is not that long ago, about two years ago, suddenly I looked at my own neighborhood through a very different lens and it seemed like there were little pieces of land that should be developed everywhere. Um, but of course, unlocking that land is uh, much harder than a new person might think. Um, so today we're going to be, our panelists are going to be talking about kind of weaving together really middle housing, infill, publicly held land, faith-based land, community land trust, social housing, um, government taking more of a role in land acquisition and readiness. Um, so I think it's going to be a really um, rich and interesting panel. Um, and I just want to start by um, talking, like kind of grounding us in why building housing within our cities, within existing neighborhoods is a good thing, which is stuff, something that we all really, I think, know and appreciate. But I think our panelists are going to be talking more about the mechanics of doing it and examples of doing it. So I thought I'd just start by um, reminding us all of why it's positive. Um, so it's nice for residents and homeowners to live near their schools, their jobs, transportation, um, cultural resources that facilitates a affordable and convenient and ecological lifestyle. Um, that also is a way of meeting our housing needs while preserving the farms and forests um, outside of our um, cities. Um, and it's also good for communities to maximize the um, use of underutilized property. Um, if you have a vacant underutilized parking lot or a water tower that's no longer in use and you can transform that space into a place for lots of kids, that's great for the whole neighborhood. Um, and then there are also potentially um, savings on land acquisition that help us build housing affordably um, if we can tap into publicly owned or faith-based land. Um, at Habitat Portland Region, we are currently building or have in pre-development 139 homes within the city of Portland that are on former church properties or former water bureau properties. Um, and the low cost of... Uh, land on those projects is part of what allows us to build three and four and five bedroom homes with four households who have an average uh, annual income of $57,000 a year. Um, so if we can crack that nut around land and affordability to make it possible to tuck affordable developments throughout our existing mixed income, mixed use neighborhoods, um, that seems like all around a win-win, um, but it's not something that happens without a lot of effort. So um, our panelists are Helmi Hisrick, who is the director of the Portland Housing Bureau. Um, Helmi has a long history in affordable housing development at the city of Los Angeles, and she's also a recognized expert on social housing. So she's going to talk to us about Vienna's forward-looking approach to land acquisition. Tony Pickett has 35 years of interdisciplinary experience in community development and is the CEO of Grounded Solutions Network, which is the nation's leading expert for inclusive affordable housing policies and programs like community land trusts, deed restricted housing and inclusionary housing. And Tony's going to talk about national examples that pair land banking with community land trust approaches. And then Britt Conroy is going to bring us home to Oregon um, and talk about, uh, Britt is the Director of Public Policy and Advocacy for Ecumenical Ministries of Oregon, or EMO, um, and Britt's going to talk about how faith-based lands can contribute to Oregon's housing needs. So I will turn it over to our panelists. Thank you. Uh, 
Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Helmi. Welcome to the coolest panel. Very appreciative of Sarah uh, inviting me to be part of this. Um, and uh, before I do the presentation, I just want to tell you a little bit about um, how I got into social housing because I think it, it's helpful. So I had I currently am working as the director of the Portland Housing Bureau. I held the exact same job in Los Angeles for about 12 years, running uh, basically a large scale low income housing tax credit development program and home ownership programs, et cetera. And in about 2015, it hit me that I had become an expert in a system that couldn't solve the problem. And we all were, we were all working really hard. I had been doing it for many, many years and realizing that after a long time with everybody uh, working you know, going full out trying to solve the housing and homelessness crisis in Los Angeles, things were just getting worse and not better, and our resources weren't enough to get us there. And I was lucky enough to get a fellowship uh, from a local Los Angeles foundation that enabled me to look around the world at other systems. I went on a quest. I thought, somebody has solved this problem. I'm going to find them. After looking at many different cities around the world, I came to really focus in on Vienna because their system is extraordinary and I will touch briefly on it. And I'll, over the last, before coming to Portland, I spent two years taking housing leaders from California to Vienna on something called the Social Housing Field Study in Vienna, which just like all of you, there's this like group of Viennese housers they get together at conferences <laughs> and they're all wonky talk, talk about housing. Um, only they have a different system to work in. And then, so I'm gonna share a little bit about that system today. Okay. So just to begin with, um, the, city, the city of Portland has just adopted a housing uh, production strategy. It's a multiple, multiple agency strategy with something like 35 different strategies that we'll be using to advance housing production, both affordable and market rate. One of the strategies that falls into the domain of the Portland Housing Bureau is to establish a citywide land, land banking strategy. So we have been talking and thinking about land banking uh, and we will, in the coming year, be focusing on how to establish a land bank for Portland. So why look at Vienna? Just, I'm going to give it a, in a nutshell. Over 100 years ago, Vienna had the worst housing in Europe. They had over 30,000 unsheltered people living on their street. Uh, those unsheltered people organized themselves into a massive movement, a self-help movement. They called themselves the Settlers Movement or the Wild Settlers Movement. Many of them were immigrants coming from Eastern Europe and other parts of um, the Austro-Hungarian Empire that was in collapse uh, into the city of Vienna. So they had a massive disease. They had a ra rampant tuberculosis and rampant Spanish flu and were considered the worst place to live in, in Europe. Um, also, lots of displacement, lots of um, hunger. You get the picture. Fast forward to today, Vienna is repeatedly ranked the number one most livable city in the world. They have been ranked that not just this last year, but actually for the last 15 years. They're always in the top few. There's actually no, no US city that's in the top 25 this last ranking, but they are considered the most affordable city, major city in Europe, and it's a growing city. It's a capitalist city. Uh, it's a democracy. So it's very similar in many respects to, um, to our environment. So how did they do it? And it's a fascinating story. I'm not going to tell that story today, but I encourage you to um, find me with a glass of wine at cocktail, and I'll tell you the whole story. So uh, the red picture here is the city of Vienna superimposed over the city of Portland. What you can see is they're roughly the same size, uh, quite similar in land area. <laughs> Vienna has 2 million people and Portland has 650,000 people. Vienna has 1 million housing units and Portland has 237,000 housing units. So basically they have one housing unit for every two people and we have one housing unit for every three people. Uh, they have 45% of their housing is affordable. 
we have 8% of our housing is affordable. Now, the definition of affordability is quite different in Vienna because affordability is actually everything to the mid, it's low and low, moderate income households. So everything from about 180% of the median income and down. So 80% of the people who live in Vienna qualify for their, what they call social housing. 55% um, of their housing is market rate and about 92% of our housing is market rate. And I'll just actually give you an aside that Portland is better than, has more affordable housing per capita than any city on the West Coast of the US. So if you look at San Diego, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Seattle, uh, Vancouver, BC, everyone has about 5% affordable housing with a 95% market rate, whereas Portland is actually pretty good with 8%, but doesn't hold a candle to Vienna. And one of the interesting things about the 45% of housing is that it's basically 45% of the housing is outside of the market. So it's non-market and it has a huge dampening effect on the whole city overall, because everyone really gets to choose whether they wanna be in market housing which has price appreciation, or if they want to access the affordable sector, which actually just has reasonably priced housing that you can afford. Okay, their land bank in Vienna was established in 1984. Uh, and, and this is the deputy mayor of um, housing and women's, uh, Deputy Mayor and Executive Counselor for Housing and Women. She's also the chairperson of the Von Fons Wien. Von Fons Wien is the name of the Viennese Land Bank. And um, it is a, it was established in 1984 and it's the, actually the most active land buyer in the city of Vienna. I'll just add that Vienna is both a city and a state. Uh, so it is the largest, most populous state in the state of Austria. I've been in the country of Austria. And uh, they have funded the development of over 120,000 residential units in the last 40 years. The quote that is under this picture, I actually want to mention because it's very fundamental to the way they think about housing and it really has started to shape the way I think about housing. Social housing policies in Vienna have been shaped by the political commitment that housing is a basic right. So the idea of housing as a human right, it's actually not embedded in their law, but if you were to go to the conference in Vienna, the housing conference, that's what they would all be talking about. They all talk about it. From the development community to the public sector talks about housing as a human right, and they, tr they function that way. It sort of informs everything they do. So what is the role of this agency? The agency, First of all, they are active land buyers. Uh, in the last 40 years, they bought about 900 acres. That's actually an old statistic, so it's probably more, but I couldn't find one that was documented. So this is about six years old. They had purchased over 900 acres in the city of Vienna. They serve as a convener because they not only buy land, uh, and I, let me just add their land acquisition is very much tied to their prospective housing need. So, for example, the city of Portland has estimated the need of household, housing for households under 80% of AMI between now and the next 20 years. The estimated need for housing is 63,000 units of housing in the city of Portland. Um, in Vienna, that translates into a land acquisition strategy. They start thinking about how do we acquire land so that we can build that much housing. They serve as a convener. Von von Wiens convenes city agencies, state agencies, and federal agencies together. So they actually act very importantly as a convener. They bring all the parties to the table. So not only when they buy land, they're not only looking at housing, they're talking to the parks, they're talking about transportation, they're talking about water, they're talking about open space. So they're really um, very holistic in their approach and they bring departments together to plan to plan the future of those sites. They do site prep. They act to take the risk out of the development system. So they essentially go in, they acquire land, they clear the land, they, they zone the land. So what are the tools they use? They do by right zoning. So they essentially create zoning. 
the law in Vienna for housing that is converting from non-commercial, I mean from non-residential to residential use, is if it converts, it must have two-thirds social housing on it. So for every land that goes, say, from industrial land to residential or commercial land to residential, you, not, you know that it will have two-thirds of the land will have um, social housing on it or be out of the market. Um, they offer public subsidies, so they are a pass-through agency, essentially, providing subsidies to the development community. Most of the development in Vienna is actually done by private non, I mean, by nonprofits. Um, it's not, actually very little of it is currently done by the, by the um, city itself. Historically, back 100 years ago, the city was building, but in about the 1980s, they shifted over to a, to a model called limited profit housing, which is primarily done by nonprofits. And they run developer competitions. The thing that's interesting about their developer competitions is uh, not only do they do financial feasibility, design quality, environmental sustainability, but they also evaluate social sustainability. So they're actually looking at how does this project that we're going to see make a contribution to the community? What's the sustainability for both their tenants as well as for how it fits, fits into the neighborhood? So how do they pay for all of this? They have a, a tax, a 1% income tax in Austria at the federal level, paid 50% by the employer and 50% by the employee allocated to the state. The state, in this case, the state slash city of Vienna gets to use it how they choose. Uh, in Vienna, they that means they have about $250 million in annual tax revenue. And they have about 200, it says euros, these are euros actually. So 250 euros in income tax and about 200 million euros in loan repayments and ground lease repayments are coming in every year. So they have approximately $450 million annually in perpetuity for housing, for affordable housing sector. 85% of it is, is allocated to capital costs. Of that, two thirds is located for acquisition of land and new construction. So they're putting approximately $250 million a year into land acquisition and construction. Um, okay, so this is an example of the kind of uh, development they've done. This is a place called Zestadt Aspern. Um, thinking in advance about it's about thinking in advance about the growing population in Vienna, knowing they need to add a lot of units of housing. They actually purchased an old airfield and worked with a master developer to figure it out. So this is an actually an old airfield. And if you know Austria, Austria is on the eastern end of Europe. This actually was an area that was contiguous with Slovakia and Hungary. And um, so it sort of wasn't developed for a long time when the Eastern European countries, there was sort of the Iron Curtain and there was not a lot of development on the east side of Vienna. But it's very wide open space and they decided to build a city, what they call a city within the city. So they acquired an airfield. They're building over 12,000 units of housing. 75% of it will be social housing or out of the market, but it takes all kinds of forms. So um, they'll have about 20,000 residents, uh, lots of commercial open space. They actually built this um, couple of things about Zestadt. They built the lake in the center. That's a man-made lake, or in this case, probably a woman-made lake. Um, they. I'll tell you why I say that. So they built this lake really as effect of moderating the effect of climate change. It's a, it's a landlocked country, and so they need things that will reduce the temperature. Um, and uh, in this particular case, they've employed what are called feminist planning principles, really thinking about how to create a safe, walkable environment. There's almost no cars here. All the cars are on the perimeter. It's all very walkable. Your kids can run around. Um, there's several schools. There's... Um, and actually, interestingly, it's, a, it's working to be carbon neutral. They've partnered with Siemens to create a, per, a net zero city, essentially, or net zero neighborhood. The first thing the public sector did was build the train. They actually built the train before they planned the city. And so you can get on the train here and get into the city, downtown center of Vienna, in about 20 minutes. And every single street in here is named after a woman. That's to... Uh, <laughs> 
And the reason they did that, I thought was kind of interesting. It that wasn't. It was just that they realized that almost all the streets in Vienna were named after famous men, and so they were trying to create a gender balance. So they just decided to do that here. This is actually a picture inside Zestadt. Quickly, they have um, limited profit housing, which is a mixed income, non-market housing typology, which um, is a very interesting model that I think we should be looking at. Uh, they do market rate housing, they do apartment housing, they do actually uh, public housing or municipally owned housing, which is very low barrier to entry affordable housing. They do temporary residences, they do student housing. The student housing here, just to give you some context, they have some student housing here that um, if you're a student in Vienna, the university is free and you can get housing units here for about 200, 200 to $300 a month. Um, and the housing development, the student housing is net zero. It's actually better than net zero. It's energy plus. So it contributes more energy to the grid than it takes. It's really amazing to see this. Um, and it, it's just their norm. It's just kind of what they're doing. So lastly, I just want to mention, uh, while spending time getting to know Vienna, I was suggested to read this book. This is a British uh, publishing house. The, the book is called Rethinking the Economics of Land and Housing. And this is something that I think they get in Vienna that we have not yet in the US gotten. That land costs actually are the driver of a lot of housing costs, housing market prices. So I'm just gonna read this quote because it gets to the struggle that we have. There's a paradox at the heart of land ownership the spread of ownership of land has helped to drive economic development, democratized power, and spread wealth. So it's in a lot of very positive things. Yet it equally has a tendency towards the concentration and monopolization of resources via excessive rent extraction with increasingly negative economic impacts at the aggregate level, even as the paper wealth of those owning the property may increase. What this is, is when we talk, when we think about housing in the US, we think we often struggle with this conversation of, but wealth creation is really important. Ownership is really important. We are an ownership society. But they think of wealth creation in Vienna as really keeping your housing prices low and using your money for other things. So when, when we at Portland Housing Bureau think about creating a land bank, what, what we're thinking about is what's the American version of the social housing model? How do we take our concepts of ownership and yet also take this idea that we want to um, make housing affordable for everybody? How do we drive forward on that? And what are, how do we use the system? And that's why I'm very excited to be on the panel with these two gentlemen, because I actually think the solutions in the US are gonna be talked about on this panel. So um, that's how they do it there. And how are we gonna do it here? Thanks. Plenary session about the network that I lead, Grounded Solutions. Um, I'm not gonna read it to you, but this is the mission statement of Grounded Solutions. And the important part is advancing affordable housing solutions that last for generations, that idea of lasting affordability that I mentioned earlier. It also exists within what I call the housing continuum. And that's everything on one end from just standard rental to ownership, private market ownership at the other end. And shared equity models, as we call them with lasting affordability, are in the middle. Um, they, they, they sort of straddle uh, both things. Uh, most shared equity models uh, really promote this idea of uh, a separation of the ownership of land from the structure that exists on the land. In shared equity home ownership, we have a long-term ground lease with a homeowner who actually owns the improvements and has a mortgage on it. And the ground lease actually controls the relationship between the nonprofit community land trust owner and the homeowner. Built into that ground lease, there's also a resale formula because we also restrict the amount of equity that a selling homeowner is allowed to take with them upon deciding to sell that home. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, we've done research on these models over the last 30 year period. 
And uh, the result says that the average tenure is five to seven years. And for an initial investment on average of about $1,800 of the low moderate income families own money, um, the rest is subsidized. Um, they are able to generate a return over that five to seven year period. The limited equity return from that is $14,000. The longer you stay, the more you get. But again, there, there's some trade off to that. The bulk of that equity stays in that property and makes it affordable for the next family. So we've got wealth creation because that $14,000. Uh, most often, in 60% of the cases, those folks went on to buy unsubsidized homes. And so whenever the question is asked, is this fair? The answer is yes, <laughs> it is. Um, but it's not the only approach that yields that. In addition to community land trusts, there are resident-owned communities working in the manufactured housing space. Um, there are long-term deed restricted programs that municipal housing programs are using to maintain affordability. There are limited equity cooperatives uh, in various parts of the country that also use that approach as well. So I just want to be clear about kind of the spectrum of models that we're talking about. And as Helmi uh, alluded to, um, we've had a lot of interaction with our European colleagues over the years, and they consider shared equity to be kind of the, the social housing model here in the U.S. So um, as Helmi was alluding to, uh, beyond Austria, um, Belgium, Switzerland, France, England, they all have their own version of social housing and they all have different legal contexts. So property ownership laws differ across all of those contexts, as it does here uh, between us and, and our European colleagues. So everyone has uh, determined their own um, legal approach to implementing the approach. Today, um, according to the last census that we have done of shared equity models across the US, you can see it here, um, there are about 314 shared equity organizations operating in 46 states. Uh, I don't know what's wrong with the rest of those states, but DC and Puerto Rico are included in that. Um, and that's a 30% increase in the amount of programs. And again, back to uh, the comment I made earlier on scale, need more. That, that's the bottom line of it. In addition, uh, there's uh, something that we refer to as the classic community land trust model, which I just described earlier with the ground lease and the resale formula. And there are also hybrid innovations. Uh, one example that I always point to is in Denver, Colorado, an entity called the Urban Land Conservancy. Um, it operates at a regional scale. Um, it is both using informal land banking strategies, going in and acquiring real estate. And in this case, it was along um, an extension of their light rail system that was built out over several years. So once the station locations had been identified and the routes were under construction, the Urban Land Conservancy raised capital and purchased on the open market specific parcels of land with the intent of developing that in partnership with either for-profit or non-profit developers, low-income housing tax credits, and various other subsidy programs as permanently affordable housing in a mixed income context. So by the time the light rail construction was done and the stations opened, you had not magically, but intentionally uh, mixed income housing so that uh, folks had access to transportation to get to jobs and, and their other um, needs. One example that I want to um, highlight um, of a hybrid nature is a land bank. How many people in this audience know what a traditional land bank is? Like, what's the definition of it? Not many folks. Some, some but not many. A land bank is a quasi-governmental entity. It is um, enacted through state legislation. And what they're doing is creating an entity with the power to 
take ownership of tax delinquent and otherwise underutilized property. Um, the approach kind of uh, started in Michigan uh, and it was mainly environmentally, environmentally compromised property uh, that it was focused on in Michigan, but it's been replicated in other states across the country um, with varying uh, focus and intent. Um, but the example I wanna highlight is in Richmond, Virginia, and uh, it is called the Maggie Walker Community Land Trust. It is unique in the fact that it is both a community land trust and a state authorized land bank. So they don't have to uh, broker transactions between two different entities. And that, that is also in existence. There are separate land banks um, that often partner with nonprofit uh, affordable housing programs. But in that case, in Richmond itself uh, and the surrounding counties, Maggie Walker is the land banking entity. And what that does is it gives them access to a pipeline of property so they don't have to go out and raise capital and acquire property on the open market. They don't have to wait for land donations. Um, they have ready access to a pipeline of properties. And you can kind of see here the, the timeline of the creation uh, of the land bank from Virginia General Assembly enacting the legislation to in 2024, one of the surrounding counties um, put $60 million into the expansion of the affordable housing programs of the Maggie Walker Community Land Trust. And you can also see uh, the median home sales price of $165,000 versus $385,000 on the open market. So, so you have questions about what's the nature of affordability there. It's pretty clear um, what it is. Lastly, I just wanna kind of say that we're doing a lot of different things uh, to support um, lasting affordability, both from the land banking as well as uh, the community land trust and shared equity perspective. Um, one of the things that I do want you to know because we're in Oregon is uh, several years ago, we created what we called our catalytic land uh, cohort. And that was uh, Portland, Oregon, Houston, Texas, and Atlanta, Georgia. And we fostered uh, learning exchange and technical assistance and capacity building so that groups who were trying to figure out partnerships between land banks and land trusts in those three cities could talk to each other. Um, Portland was at the early stage of those conversations, just beginning to kind of be interested in the concept um, Houston had actually implemented a major land bank land trust partnership, um, and it resulted from the impact of the hurricanes several years ago in Houston, wanting to um, really repair homes and prevent people from being displaced long term. The city of Houston actually invested and fostered a partnership between its existing land bank and a new community land trust program. Um, we provided technical assistance, created a business plan, and coached uh, staff at the Houston Community Land Trust to implement that program. And then in Atlanta, uh, the community land trust that I started in 2010 partnered with the local land bank and created um, what they called a land banking depository agreement such that uh, the community land trust could uh, park its uh, undeveloped property inventory in the land bank, tax-free, managed by the land bank until they could go through all of the planning, zoning, pre-development that they needed to achieve to actually uh, create new affordable housing on that property over time. Um, beyond that, um, we also have an initiative called For Everyone Home. Uh, we solicit uh, proposals from local municipal governments, and we engage them in a 24-month partnership uh, to really figure out what is their uh, affordable housing expansion strategy from a policy standpoint, um, and have had great success in doing that. Um, the most recent example of that, um, we are partnering with DuPage County, which is just outside of Chicago. So there are multiple city jurisdictions within the county um, 
all focusing now on creating lasting affordability. Um, also, I just want to name the fact that we've recently ourselves, again, gotten into the uh, real estate acquisition business, and uh, we've done it so effectively um, last year, late last year, we won what was called the Housing Affordability Breakthrough Challenge. Enterprise and Wells Fargo awarded us a multi-million dollar grant um, to actually implement uh, that land acquisition strategy. Um, the first example of which is going to be in the Twin Cities region, but um, Atlanta is on the heels of that. And we're evaluating additional places once we prove out um, that approach to actually creating inventories, larger inventories, of homes with lasting affordability that we can turn over to local affordable housing community-based entities. We don't intend to be the long-term owner and manager of affordable housing ourselves, but we're using our balance sheet and our reputation to foster uh, more access to real estate for our local organizations on the ground. So. Um, I'm going to stop there because I know we're going to have a little Q&A and uh, you'll be able to ask some more detailed questions. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. Next time we do this, I'm going first. Uh, it's hard to, hard to follow someone who flies us to Vienna and then Tony's not speaking just once, but twice at this conference. So uh, it's good to appreciate what, what a great um, colleagues to, to be with you on this panel. So my name is Britt Conray. I'm director of uh, um, director of public policy and environmental advocacy at Ecumenical Ministries of Oregon. EMO is a statewide association of churches and interfaith partners. We're connected to about 750 places of worship across the state. And your program says that I'm here to talk about land, about uh, faith land that's prime for development. But really, really, I'm here to talk about people. EMO, in addition to being connected with faith communities, operates seven direct service programs, five of which have a housing component. We are proud to offer a program that serves the Slavic community, survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault. So when a, when a, when a woman and her kids make a phone call that need a new place to stay and need safety, we offer that place and we advocate at the state legislature to make sure there's enough of those places available. We resettle refugees, one of six organizations here in Oregon that, that provides new a new start for refugees. And in the housing space, in that context, you see folks who were national leaders in their home countries. Uh, for example, I think of a, a man I just sat down to tea with. He, was, he showed me on his phone pictures of him standing alongside uh, David Petraeus and General McMaster and Senator Lindsey Graham in Kabul, and now he pushes a golf cart through gravel from the food pantry to his house, and he's in desperate need of affordable housing. We also offer a program for youth who are experiencing homelessness. We match youth who are by themselves and homeless with people, to, with homeowners who have um, open bedrooms and open hearts to offer that space so that kid can stay in school, graduate, and move forward in life. Uh, the other, another example is that we uh, partner with the city of Portland and others to offer uh, AC units to keep people housed in low-income housing uh, here in this region. So today I do want to talk about land, but for us, that's, that's what we're really talking about is how do we unlock significant amounts of faith property across the state to make it available for affordable housing. Uh, these are uh, some of our key partners in our advocacy work and planning work, Loving Community Land and Housing Coalition and Square One Villages. Um, we've really been fortunate to have some great partnerships with the governor's office, with Hacienda, with Northwest Housing Alternatives, uh, Catholic Charities, and many, many others in our advocacy work down in Salem to try to find a way to turn these unused, underutilized, uh, untaxed properties into uh, something that can address our housing crisis. This is a map that my seven-year-old could have done a better job uh, drawing, but um, what you see here, if you were to zoom in, is that each of these dots continues to spit out more and more dots. If I just was hovering over the Portland area, you'd see more than a couple dozen churches that are already on our list offering up their land 
for this effort. Um, this represents about 10% of every church in the state of Oregon. And I am confident that in the next five years, a third of the churches in the state of Oregon are going to be on our spreadsheet wanting to partner with folks like you to build affordable housing. A couple of success stories. Uh, Portsmouth Commons is, you may have heard about it, in North Portland, built on Portsmouth Union's uh, property. It was an eight-year slog uh, for a faith community to understand housing, partner, and move forward to do a spot where, uh, after three legislative sessions, uh, some help from Governor Kotek and others, uh, 20 family, 20 uh, individuals who are veterans and their families were were housed. A really, really great success. Down in Eugene, you have uh, Square One Village's Peace Village Co-op that took uh, a large grassy field and turned it into really, really attractive housing at a cost uh, under $165,000 per unit, uh, allowing folks um, through a community land trust uh, to enter into a new kind of, or at least I think new in, in this area, new kind of uh, home ownership model. Um, and what's exciting about, how many I already started this earlier today, what's exciting about these projects from, from the faith community's perspective is that it matches their mission, right? Congregations, not all of them, many congregations are cash poor and land rich. They want to help solve the housing crisis. That's, that's what motivates them as a community. And they're offering up their land as part of this, part of the, part of this effort. At the same time, there's other ministries, they would say, that they want to continue. They want to maybe still have a place for worship, or they still have that food pantry that they want to house somewhere, or they want to open a daycare with partnering with the Children's Institute or another group. And they're looking for a developer that can help bring that, bring that to bear. So there's both uh, their, their own community is strengthened while they also offer housing to their, to their neighbors. Um, Many of these slides uh, I stole from other people. Um, we were going to be joined by Reverend Julia Nielsen, who's, who built the Portsmouth Commons. Um, she uh, reached out. I'm going to give her a bad time in front of all you. She reached out um, today, and she had been in a, a car accident. She's fine, but couldn't make it. So, you know, the classic car accident excuse. Um, um, but uh, but uh, in all seriousness, she's put together, she and, and Reverend Dan Bryant and Eugenia have put together some of these slides and as people of faith, as pastors themselves, really see this work um, in tr of, of, of pregnant housing as also being a way to transform their own communities that they serve, right? Moving, uh, not just providing housing, but moving from owners of a property to, to stewards of land and resources, of, of moving from a spot where, in this example, where um, a community has decided to, to give back land to a local tribe as, a, as part of their growth as a community and what it means to be uh, good neighbors in this space. So Tony talked about a kind of a spectrum of uses that, uh, that could be employed in the, in the projects that he works on. Within the faith context, we have the land back or, or, or legacy repair effort that I just mentioned the ground leasing that allows a congregation to receive even just minimal income over 60 or 90 years and allows them to keep providing that food pantry, keep providing that childcare facility um, and making use of their land or sale or selling their land simply um, for the common good. There's many, many developers that they could approach and get top dollar, but again, folks want to make the most um, of the land, want their sale to match their mission. I think it's really exciting to, uh, as an advocate down, in, down at the Capitol in a moment of, a, of this ongoing housing crisis is be able to communicate how faith communities and other nonprofit partners are, gonna, are launching into a multi-step process whenever they develop housing that can help the state solve really pressing problems every step along the way. So, for example, we go to a church and say, who expresses interest in developing uh, portable housing on their land. Years one and two, maybe they offer car camping in their parking lot. Then maybe they open a shelter in their basement. And then maybe they roll some tiny homes onto that property as they're going through the steps that folks in this room, I think, know far better than I, are time consuming. And then finally, that 70-unit multifamily apartment is built. And they've helped, again, in my mind as a 
somebody who works with politicians all day, help our elected leaders solve problems along the way. And that's really, it's really exciting. And, and what it can also mean is that a church who maybe thought they were going to be able to build a big apartment building maybe only gets to shelters, maybe only gets to tiny homes before something doesn't quite work out, and yet that is a success in and of itself. So I think on the policy front, I want to talk just a, a couple minutes about where faith entities get stuck. And this, this applies to, we're running legislation that, that would see these developments at, you know, with their tribal partners and with housing authorities and local governments, and, but really the faith angle is, is where I can speak in the most informed way. But first of all, it's, it's this question of feasibility. Um, you know, is, I'm talking to you folks who know better than I, but you know, what, is, is this piece of property really going to work for what, uh, um, is our vision really possible on the zoning? Do, can we have an initial architect come in, uh, engineer, those kind of things? The second piece is equally important is how do we get to a spot where we don't spend years developing a program only to see it killed at, the, at, at a planning meeting uh, five years later? And what Reverend Julie Nielsen and our other friends uh, do really well is, is from day one, at an extremely low cost, when you think about what uh, uh, the, um, what's possible in getting these units out, is, is meeting with neighbors from the day one and getting them excited to be part of this neighborhood solution. Uh, Reverend Nielsen talks often about going to a planning meeting uh, in the Laurelhurst neighbor, neighborhood of, of here in Northeast Portland several years ago, where they had worked on one piece of church property for a couple years with the community, and people came out in support, testified, and another developer had it just a few blocks away, had it partnered with the neighborhood, and the community came out and shot that down and killed that project. Um, what we, when we turn to the state legislature, we, we really make a pitch of, help us help you. We have a lot of land. We're ready to build a lot of units. Um, help us have these neighborhood conversations and help congregations in, who really have no cash and no expertise do some initial feasibility work to see if this is possible and then start partnering with uh, many of our great affordable housing developers that are out there. Um, just in the recent recent months, many of you might know that uh, OHCS uh, launched a uh, project feasibility loan program to cover some of these pieces. I think they're looking at grants of about $50,000 each. Um, and I won't make you read through all that, but, uh, and then also separately a, a pre-development loan program. Um, and what we're trying to do all in the advocacy space is say that Faith communities lack the financial uh, background and expertise to engage in loan programs, but they're ready to offer their land for free or at reduced costs if you can get us a grant instead of a loan to go through a couple of these early steps and offer up that land to 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 a to housing to housing um, for a housing developer. Um, so the. This is another photo of the Square One Villages project down in Eugene, and and really the the key here is again how do you get how how do we help faith communities go from this idea to actually soil soil being turned over? This is just a slide that s lays out a little bit about um, protests dating over a hundred years to to new to affordable housing development. So how do we how do we invest in, in that community engagement piece that allows community buy, neighborhood buy, and not neighborhood opposition? Um, if Reverend Nielsen was here, she would uh, tell us what she meant by these bullet points. Um, but I think knowing her a little bit, I know that um, she has deep, deep connections with folks um, where, again, it's as any pastor or faith leader might, might tell you, she helps the community tell a story, right? Faith leaders will tell you that they're really just storytellers um, with very, very strong beliefs in their faith. And, and, and they want to tell, want to help a neighborhood tell the story about how, what was there before and what came after and how to get there in between. And in between is the pieces that faith communities who are not affordable housing developers know nothing about the law, the contracts, um, the, the zoning and so forth. And then, and then uh, Reverend Nielsen does a tremendous job of turning out those neighbors to those public meetings or to the state legislature saying, yes, 
right? As you may, may have heard, you know, yes in God's backyard or yes in our backyard. Um, so just to flag a couple of things that we're working on with the state and with local partners, we continue to have a conversation around how do we have grants and loans together to make sure that every type of nonprofit entity can offer up their land, unlock their land. How do we engage in outreach to those landowners? How do we how do we find those folks that can both talk housing and in our case talk church and make people feel welcome that this is a process they're they're going to be um, welcome to participate in? I think the other thing that we talk about is where do we want to build our housing? Where, when you think about affordable housing and you think about where churches are, one of the things I like to do is encourage people to to drive next this week, as you're driving around town, look and see where a church is. What you'll see is that you'll see faith communities in some of the highest opportunity areas of our communities. And that land is often off limits to lowest, our lowest income neighbors and, and affordable housing projects. And that's what churches are hoping and others are hoping to, to change. I was uh, joking with Helmi earlier that uh, for about a year, we, we, we were sharing in Salem and other places the really startling statistic that within the city limits of Portland, there are 900 acres, developable acres of church land. In all of our conversations around infill and UGB and other challenges, we're, we are surrounded by faith land that is ready to go. Only after a year of giving that, giving that, that talking point to elected leaders did I learn that that also includes cemeteries. Uh, but... But, so we're, we're, we're going to redo our spreadsheet and figure out what the exact number is. Um, I mean, it's one thing to say, one thing to work for a board of two dozen people that says, well, you're, you know, after death, your soul leaves your body. It's another thing to build on top of top of cemetery. So um, the top of those bodies. But um, uh, but I think, but I, but that, that same number actually roughly is found in Washington County and in Clackamas County. And we're working with, um, with partners uh, at the state level to, to do an inventory of land all across the state. We know that affordable housing is needed in every community, in every corner of the state. And we're excited to produce um, some, some accurate numbers about, uh, about how many acres there really are all, all, around, the, all around the state. Um, I also mentioned the, the added, a couple added benefits uh, of, of this approach. One is the stabilizing of existing services. Um, whether that's a food pantry like we have at, at Ainsworth UCC Church in, in Northeast Portland uh, or uh, a homeless shelter in a different uh, part, a different community, when we can stabilize the finances of, of churches, they able to continue to offer those often invisible social services that many of our communities rely on. Similarly, the co-locating of new services are really exciting, right? We, many of our families live in childcare deserts. Or um, we were just talking today about uh, you know offers, uh, opportunities to to link elder care and child care in the same space, the same kind of uh, joyous, welcoming, uh, loneliness killing space that could be possible. So that when we think about developing new housing, we think about what could be on that ground floor. Again, maybe it's a rebuilt sanctuary, but maybe it's also these other things that we desperately need in the community. I, I come before you today really just to say that groups like ours are really ready to partner um, and get more housing built. Uh, I'll leave with one story. One, one program of ours that I didn't mention is a program that, that uh, can provide services for those with HIV and AIDS. It was launched in the mid 80s at a time when there was tremendous stigma in that space. And now, in a basement in Northeast Portland, basement of a church in Northeast Portland, there's an ongoing day center for those with HIV and AIDS. We send out medically appropriate meals to, to a six county area, which is absolutely literally a lifesaver in the pandemic, to medically fragile Oregonians. And we partner with Cascade AIDS Project so that they actually house one of their staff members at that program of EMOs that links unhoused individuals with HIV and AIDS with permanent housing. And that church is now in conversations to build uh, several units on their property. And we've had, we, we're lucky enough to have uh, the house state organs 
um, committee on housing and the, the, on the house side, house housing committee, uh, swing by for a tour a couple weeks ago to envision how this piece of property could be used, not just for the good it's already doing, but for uh, units, maybe for those exact same clients that are so that are that are living with HIV and AIDS and are unhoused on our streets that desperately need need a solution that's in in that way. So uh, the potential is great and really would welcome a chance to partner with any of all of you. So thanks for your time. Come around. We must have another mic, I think, that I can use for uh, questions. But if you can project, go ahead and raise your hand, and uh, we can do questions probably without the mic as well. Yeah. Oh, it's just the one mic? OK, well, then I, I'll just be the mic fairy. Are there any questions from the audience? Are you guys all hot? <laughs> Um, maybe other people are wondering this. So like we have a combination, Helmi and others, we have a combination of all of the components that I'm seeing here. And I'm just wondering like what you see as the like things standing between us and a model like the Vienna model, um, given that we have land banking, land acquisition funding, pre like all of these different components. Um, yeah. What's in the way? We have land banking, land acquisition, pre-development. <laughs> Yeah. So thank you. Uh, did everybody hear that question? It was sort of, yeah, sounds like you're all nodding back there. So that's good. I think, um, I think you're right. I think we have a lot of the component parts of, we have a strong community land trust uh, movement here in Oregon. We have, um, we've just done an inventory of publicly owned land. I think there's a lot of discussion about land banking. It, you know, this preceded my coming here. So there's already, it's been sort of in the ether. I think what we haven't done yet is really um, create the institutional strength that you need to really systematize it, to really make it work. Because, for example, we have made public land available to Habitat, but we didn't do any of the site clearance, site prep, or zoning, or work that would have reduced the costs of the development for them can substantially there was no sort of plan in place there's no staff in place to do that work so I think that's what we're looking at is how do you actually create more um, capacity to to not only acquire land uh, not just use remnants but really acquire land uh, or work with faith-based organizations and then um, prep it for for making it available for development yeah, I'll just add, um, just to clarify, um, there needs to be some agreement on how do you operationalize the intersection of these things? And is there an entity who's willing to play that role to lead the work? Um, how do you resource it, um, both financially and from a staffing perspective? And at what scale do you expect it to operate? Um, the various jurisdictions and their boundaries, you, you've got to figure out how to navigate all, all of that. So um, it'd be one thing if the city of Portland, for instance, agreed to do all that, but if the surrounding counties don't, um, then you're limited in terms of how much scale you can achieve. It's not insignificant, but um, I would say we've been pushing, at least from our perspective nationally, for a more regional approach. Um, again, it makes it easier to resource. It's easier to kind of understand the efficiency of it if it's operating at a larger scale. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just add one like really practical piece might be, um, assembling smaller parcels and making them developable as a single project. So like at Habitat, we do middle housing, but we still need an economy of scale to make a project pencil. Like we're not going to do a fourplex on a regular single family lot. But if like the city or Metro said, here's four lots near each other, you could do four fourplexes um, as a single project that could work. Um, so there are, I think there are smaller pieces that as that we're going to need to start digging into and figuring out how to make those work. Um, back. Are there 
and then I'll come up here. Hi, thank you. Um, so I am working right now, I'm trying to work on a CLT project for my organization. Uh, and I wanted to come back to your, your statement, Tony, about when you said, is it fair? Uh, you said, is it fair about the wealth creation piece? So one of the things that we are struggling with right now is the context, right? We are in North Northeast Portland. There was a lot of displacement that happened. We're trying to get people back, primarily uh, Black Americans, back into that. And the pushback we are getting is that if we do CLT, it restricts wealth when that land and those homes were already, they were displaced from that. So how do you think I should bring this up back to my board and my executive team about how do we deal with that issue about context? Because in the Vienna option, it seemed like it was a blank slate. So it's easy to do something when it's blank slate, there's a piece of land, but when there's land which is attached with so many issues, how do we deal with uh, the wealth creation piece? Great question. <laughs> I, I think in all of this, and you've asked the perfect question, there are trade-offs and the limited wealth creation brings with it the opportunity to benefit more than one family over time. That's, I think, part of the key question here is if, if we subsidize and create pathways to home ownership and we don't limit the wealth building capability and they decide to sell that home and it nets them a large windfall of money, but the other folks who come after them are struggling to find an affordable way into home ownership, and it's going to cost more after you've supported that first family. The time that elapses, housing costs are only going to increase, and at the end of it, it'll cost you more to try to create yet another affordable housing opportunity. So I always sort of like try to start the conversation there. I, I don't dictate to people where they end up. I just simply say, let me give you some perspective on what the choices are. And we've had folks who have said, yeah, that that shared equity and land trust stuff, that's not for us. We, we want the full wealth creation. That's fine. But understand you're giving up the opportunity to help more families in the future at the same cost that you're investing today. Unless you've got an a perpetual stream of revenue that uh, keeps pace with the cost of housing, uh, <laughs> you're, you're going to have a hard time serving folks in, in the future. So it's about sustainability and longevity of the effort as much as it's about benefiting families. But I, I don't want to ever ignore the history, the experience of folks who have suffered from discrimination and bias, um, yeah, it, it influences your decision making. There, there's got to be some healing that's got to take place. And if if that's the expression of it that a majority of folks in a particular community need in order to feel like, okay, we've adequately uh, addressed that, that's, that's what happens. But um, that's kind of how I would kind of start a conversation about it. Hi, I'm a developer in Lane County, and we develop both in the Eugene Metro and then also in rural communities. Um, and I was looking perhaps for some more insight or challenges as you see implementing these community land trust ideas and the use of faith-based land in rural communities and how you imagine that playing out. Appreciate that. I, I will have to say that in the rural context uh, that we advocate in, that that it, the same challenges exist in 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 that again you have a cash poor land rich uh, landowner that's looking that has no idea 
how to walk into a room like this and, and create a partnership. There's no idea um, how to uh, build affordable housing. Um, that is, you have a, a faith leader who will say, I went to seminary not to, uh, not, not that in, uh, enter into the, the housing world. So um, I think, I think what I would just underscore again is that um, that initial seed money that allows a, a landowner like a faith community to, to present a, a, a real plausible plan to a housing developer and move forward. Um, I will say the Oregon legislature did some great work a few years ago in, in fixing some zoning challenges that we had for both urban and rural uh, faith communities under then speaker Tina Kotek's leadership. And I think that now the question is, do we have um, the funds for community engagement and for, for feasibility that allows someone to get to a spot where they can partner? So in general, I think we've seen um, same challenges exist everywhere. And really, in the political space, I'll say a really uh, real desire by elected leaders to invest I think throughout the state and be known as as uh, statewide partners, not just um, you know blue district partners or urban partners. Yeah, thank you all. Um, just to build on that earlier kind of big question, um, obviously we have you know a land ownership system that has left a lot of folks out in really unfair ways, right? And then fundamentally, underneath all of that, this land is all stolen, right, from indigenous people. So I know, Bray, you mentioned a little bit about faith communities thinking about that. Um, but are there any kind of thoughts about how in this bigger picture view of what we could do with land, how could, how could housing development be part of a land back strategy, potentially? I've actually been seeing uh, a lot more activity in uh, the space, especially around um, returning indigenous land to tribal entities. Um, I think there's clear interest in that also at the federal level. Um, we're starting to see um, some of that happening. One thing, though, I, I think um, folks don't realize um, there are very clear like examples of success. Um, it's complicated, but um, for instance, no one seems to realize that in the town of Palm Springs, California, the local indigenous community there owns half of the land. All of those luxury hotels and all that, um, those swimming pools and palm trees, um, there's a checkerboard pattern of land parcel Every other parcel um, belongs to the local tribe, and they ground lease that to other entities. So they're deriving revenue from the ground leases um, in the same way that um, we're describing this potential faith-based partnership. Um, some of that could take place if you're if you're going to um, give that land back, um, work out some kind of long-term ground leasing agreement, which creates revenue going to the people who were impacted from the beginning, um, but also kind of allows that to happen in partnership with some other entities and them to play a role in the larger economy. Because um, we've been having this conversation at, at a bigger level. Um, ownership of assets is great, but if the same systemic barriers exclude whoever owns it from participating in the larger economy, it doesn't do them any good. So hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> like a tribal community land trust. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks, this is actually a question for Homie really, which is, um, you know, we have some buildings that have like 15 different funding sources. I call it 15 different funding sources, but our funders frequently call it leverage. <laughs> and so um, I'm just curious with the model in Vienna, like what is, how does, what is the role of leverage there? I mean, I feel like for us that, that just add, you know, add so much, I mean, I get, I get it. And at the same time, it also adds so much time to the process and cost really in the end. So 
I feel like I'm just curious, I guess, about the role of leverage there. So the, the question is, what's the role of leverage financing in Vienna? And I'll, I, I'd like to rephrase it, which is how do they how do they finance affordable housing in Vienna? There's two systems. One system, and there's in Vienna, there's 220,000 units of publicly owned housing built by the city. That is paid for like a public works project, straight up tax dollars, they build it. There's also 220 plus, 220,000 units of what are called limited profit housing, which is similar to a land trust model. And the way they finance that, there's, there's a, it's a very simple capital stack. So tenants pay a down payment to get to, to be as part of their prop. They actually are actually, we, I call it a down payment because Americans understand what down payments are. What they call it there is an own payment. And the own payment is kind of like buying into a cooperative because it's mostly cooperatively owned housing. So they, the tenant makes a contribution the nonprofits make a contribution and the nonprofit builder makes makes the contribution and to be clear well i can't go into the details they 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 have a system of of constantly getting more money into the nonprofit that they have to they're obligated to reinvest but back to the capital stack tenant makes a contribution the builder developer nonprofit um, entity makes a contribution the banks make a loan and the government makes a loan. The government loan is typically at 1%. They will amortize it over a long period of time to try to drive the a monthly cost down. So they'll do like 40, sometimes 50 year amortizations. The banks also will be very flexible on their amortizations. And the whole idea is that the rent that's charged is actually the cost of the construction. So it's called a cost-based model. And it's a variety of uh, everybody who earns 180% of the area median. That's again, an American Americanization of their model, but essentially everyone who is qualified to access that housing. 50% of it is leased by the city and the city can provide some supports for both the down payment and also um, the city will offer some subsidies sometimes to, to reduce rents. The rest of it is leased by the owner of the building and quite however they want to lease it as long as the household qualifies. Um, you can look every unit up online. You can see it all before you lease it, whether you're going for the lower income or the slightly more expensive ones. But what ultimately it creates a mix, the, your income is checked once, your income is checked at lease up, never again. You can earn as much money and your rent can stay really low. And, um, and you can pass that unit on to your child. So in that, or to, to a relative parent or child, particularly if they're living with you. So there's a whole system. They actually don't really allocate based on income, they allocate based on need, but it's because they have such an abundant supply of affordable housing that they, they don't really, they're not so focused on how much you're earning. They're very focused on why do you, you know, we need to help you. And they're very focused on keep preventing displacement. Uh, similar question, but maybe for Tony on land banking, how does that finance work, financing work with the quasi-governmental agencies? I think all of our minds maybe go immediately to the financing piece. Yeah, the land banks aren't being financed themselves. They're actually deriving their revenue from the municipal budget. Um, so um, that's why once the state authorizes that, it's usually a municipality approaching the state to actually ask for that legislation to be approved. Um, they've already included some operating revenue for the land bank in the municipal budget. Now, what the municipality really wants is um, some percentage of that property to come back on to the tax rolls as an improved value so that they can justify uh, outlaying that that revenue it, it has uh, a community benefit but 
we've been able to, in a lot of instances, convince them that it doesn't all have to come back at the full tax um, market rate. Um, some of that really needs to be devoted to meet that affordable housing need because we're so short in terms of uh, affordable housing units. Um, there's not, at this case, like a land bank standalone, um, you know, true quasi-governmental entity that is actually financing their own home construction that I'm aware of. They're usually um, disposing of that property by transferring it to another entity to make that happen. And that's who assembles the financing. And it's uh, to the earlier questions point, a, a complicated layering of sources that takes time and effort to assemble. hot and stuffy in this room and you've all been great audience members um so if if we're done that's quite all right but if going once going twice any other questions all right yeah thank you so much